Welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. We're glad you've joined us today. Today we are continuing with our worship series, Do, where we examine events from Jesus' early ministry and consider how those events in Christ's life call us to action today. Let us now worship God together. You know, there's a phrase I often have thought of and repeated around the church, sometimes during worship, uh, sometimes here, even on these videos to you, and it's a piece of wisdom from my dad. Uh, basically, it goes in some iteration of the following. God did not go through all the trouble of becoming human to make us more religious. No, God did it to make us more human. Jesus the incarnation, Jesus coming here to be with us, is not to make us religious, but rather human. The whole Jesus thing really is that simple. Jesus matters because he calls us back to being the kind of people God has intended for us to be. That, that is the whole point to today's story. So for those of you who like to crack open your Bibles at home while we're doing all this, 
This comes from Matthew's Gospel. It's chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. It's short, but powerful. Effectively, this is the moment where Jesus calls Matthew to follow him as a, as a disciple. So here it goes. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came, and there were sitting with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. All right. In this story, the Pharisees jump right out at me. I, I, I feel sorry for them. They tie themselves up into these little knots to get it right. And it seems that they have to play this weird game of measuring who's in versus who is out of God's favor to even feel okay about themselves. So much of their energy is spent naming who is wrong or who is unrighteous or who is sinful. And one thing that always gets me is their really complicated relationship with Jesus himself. Now, the Pharisees throughout the New Testament are drawn to Jesus. There's, there's something about Jesus that is like a magnet or a light to, you know, of, of a flame for moths. There's something about his teachings that they love. But then he does things that they know are not okay. Like working on the Sabbath, for example. And, well, like today's story, befriending the undesirables. Undesirables like prostitutes in some cases and tax collectors in today's story. And this has always struck me as odd. You know, you have this weird dynamic playing out with the tax collectors being this group that abuses power for own personal gain. And when Jesus goes to sit with them, yes, they're kind of pushed out on the societal margins because nobody likes them, but it's really this weird dynamic that they have with power that makes them need grace, to need mercy, to need exactly what Jesus says he's there to do. And so when the Pharisees come to him and say, what is going on with this guy? I love Jesus's response. He turns right to them and says, those who are well have no need of a, of a physician. And then he turns on this dime and he goes right back and delivers this reminder that God, through the prophets, has desired for us to be merciful to each other. And then there's a second thing that he does. Jesus stays just as connected to the Pharisees they come to him as he does the so-called sinning sinners who sin, the tax collectors. Jesus' response is beautiful. He teaches them a lesson. He reminds them of a piece of scripture they should know well and turns that as a response to them. But he stays in relationship. He offers them the same mercy that he offers the people they judge. So to be plain about it, Jesus is demonstrating himself to be this simple man of love and mercy that God asks of all humanity. And he does it in a way that shows these Pharisees to be just as broken and just as in need of mercy as the very people they judge. So Christ's words bring to mind a phrase that I grew up with in the American South, and maybe you've heard it as well, but I remember hearing this a lot. Sometimes you would hear somebody say, oh, that person needs Jesus. Well, I also heard the refrain that came with that in church that everybody needs Jesus. Thinking about the South, I recall a lot of really complicated relationships. I mean, I have beloved members of my family and, and even others that probably could only be seen as bigots. Most of them are from a different generation, but it doesn't smooth anything over. It's a complicated relationship. I love the food of the South, our music. I love our art. I love our traditions. I love our culture, but it's complicated. 
And one example I, I, I kind of want to share with you today comes from music. I love the band Leonard Skinner. I have to admit that. There, I feel better getting that off my chest. But let's face it, this is not a band who's the most enlightened when we think of a modern society. Their song portfolio is filled with phrases that I might love musically, but I also kind of cringe over. This is not a band that was interested in being politically correct or even correct in any measure. In fact, even the way they got their name is this kind of tongue-in-cheek joke that you see peppered throughout most of their songs. If you remember the uh, Camp Granada song by Alan Sherman, this goes back quite a ways, but if you remember this, this is from the TV days. And he's singing, he's writing, a, he's singing while he writes a note home from summer camp. And he says, hello, Mutta, hello, Fada. Here I am at Camp Granada. Camp is very entertaining. And they say we'll have some fun if it stops raining. The second verse actually is part of why this band got their name. I went hiking with Joe Spivey. He developed Poison Ivy. You remember Leonard Skinner. That name right there. That name, Leonard Skinner, comes back for that band years later. And they're growing up as children. They end up having, and this is according to legend of survivors of the band, they had a, a phys ed teacher by the same name. And somehow between that song and having this phys ed teacher uh, with the very same name from Robert E. Lee High School growing up in Jacksonville. And they chose this name in part in defiance of his views on men with long hair. And so thinking of our story today, you have this band who's not politically correct at all, with whom I have a complicated relationship, that saw him, Leonard Skinner, from which they got Leonard Skinner, as this almost establishment Pharisee type judging them, and they were the ones pushed to the margins without any power. This young band sees themselves in that place. They, they write music though that places other people there. Much of the song lyrics have aged poorly. And one of my favorites, Simple Man, still assumes a worldview that frankly leaves out some of the people I'm close to today and makes no assumption that they fit into uh, life. And yet, if we listen to the lyrics, which I'm gonna to read to you, I won't, promise I won't sing them, but read to you in a moment, their song, Simple Man, I think connects back to some of what Jesus is up to. So listen to this. It's assuming a mother speaking to her young son. Come sit beside me, my only son, and listen closely to what I say. And if you do this, it'll help you some sunny day. Take your time. Don't live too fast. Troubles will come and they will pass. This is the part that gets fairly dated. You'll find a woman. Yeah, and you'll find love. Whoops. We have no record of Jesus getting married. And don't forget, son, uh, son, there's someone up above. I think he got that part. The song continues. And be a simple kind of man. Oh, be something you love and understand. Baby, be a simple kind of man. Oh, won't you do this for me, son, if you can? The, refa the refrain, that one right there, repeats several times throughout the song. But the other verses talk of, Forget your lust for the rich man's gold. All you need is in your soul. And you can do this, oh baby, if you try. All that I want for you, my son, is to be satisfied. Now we have to take this band, warts and all, okay? Because I'm sorry, but the sentiment that holds this song together is, I believe, stunningly beautiful. It is a simple piece of poetry that speaks truth of real human condition. I think it points directly at what Jesus is in fact doing the very moment that these Pharisees freak out. These lyrics, they point a path, imperfect as they may be, and they remind us that Christ represents the simple man who simply loves. Jesus lives to make room to pull everyone, tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, even the Pharisees, Jesus lives to make room to pull everyone, even the Pharisees, into his family, loving us, warts and all. So friends, remember this. Whether you see yourself as someone who has it mostly sorted out, or if you see yourself as someone who is a complete failure grasping for help, 
Jesus loves you, wards and all. And that is all that is really ever truly asked of you for others. Amen.
Son and Holy Ghost. As we prepare to enter into a time of prayer together, if you have a joy or concern that you would like the staff to know about or to be added to our prayer list, please feel free to contact one of the pastors or the office. Let us now go to God in prayer. God who leads us, we seek to follow you in our lives, but so often we get distracted, lose our way, or purposefully choose to wander. We thank you that even in those times when we get a little or even a lot lost, that you never stray from us, always loving us and showing us the way back to you. We praise you for the people and situations in this world that show us that love and the opportunities that we have to be an example of love to other people Give us the strength and courage to step into those moments and own our place as your children, to be a shining light in this world. God of compassion, we lift up situations in our lives and in our communities that are hard to face. We pray for those who are dealing with divorce and separation, who may be mourning the loss of an ideal or a family, for those who are having to find new ways of existing after normalcy is gone. We lift up the communities in California who have recently been victims of senseless gun violence and all others who face situations where guns and violence are an everyday presence. We pray for people who have received news from doctors that is upsetting, knowing that even when there are clear answers that it doesn't necessarily mean something can be done or fixed or cured. Guide those who are having to care for friends and family through sickness and injury, that they can be supportive and understanding, but also encouraging and resilient when needed. God of justice, every day we see the results of oppression, racism, sexism, greed, and power in our society how those actions tear apart the community and the family of God, how we struggle to recognize your face in the face of others who we see as different. Change our perspective, challenge our understanding, and put us in situations where we can learn about others. Soften our hearts in order that we might seek understanding of your children, seeing that we are all loved and cherished by you valued for the individuals that we are, but also that each of us represents an embodiment of the holy on this earth. Creative God, we praise you for the beauty and mystery of the world around us. We thank you for the rain and for the sun, both needed for life to exist, and each other with their own benefits. We thank you for delicious food and fun things that bring us laughter, we thank you for smiles on the faces of children and opportunities to be with each other in the same place. We shout your glory to all the earth and whisper your praise in our quiet prayers. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ, sealing them with the prayers on our hearts and minds as we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, join us next week as we continue to watch Jesus in his early ministry. Well, next week we're going to see him saying to his first followers, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers few. And we'll have the opportunity to ask ourselves what we are going to do about it. Now, until then, know that you are loved far more than you could ever hope or imagine and be at peace.